welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Madeline. Dad is also with us in the room right now, but he's not going to be in, in view until later because he's still a bit tired. Yeah. Um, he will be joining us later and uh, say hello to give you an update on his health and also to say a big, big thank you to all the people who've been supporting us. Yeah, definitely. So Fruity Knitting is a 90-minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world as well as extra little snippets of travel and history and storytelling that we always hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. So I have been very slowly preparing a proper knitting episode for you and I'm really thrilled that it's finally ready for me to present to you and share with you. So for new viewers... This is Madeline. Madeline is Andrew and my daughter, and she's come down to visit Andrew in the clinic for a couple of days here. And she's going to help me after we've recorded to do a little bit on the post-production, as well as being a pretty face. <laughs> it's good to have a pretty face on the camera. Or two. <laughs> So we have some fantastic guests on today's show. Our feature interview is with Flora Collingwood Norris, who is a really talented young UK designer. So Flora worked as a knitwear designer for different fashion houses, and she also worked as a knitwear lecturer before starting her own company in the Scottish borders. So it was actually Andrew who, who drew my attention to Flora in the first place. He was following her Instagram feed and he was just really impressed with her colours. He thought he would happily wear any of her colour combinations. And he was also really impressed with how she's pushed to find a path that combines her need to earn a living while still maintaining her own ideals and integrity. And that's sometimes a real challenge to do in the textile or fashion world. And one of the ways she's managed to keep her business going, especially during these really challenging COVID lockdown times, is to develop a series of online tutorials on design-led mending or visible mending. So Flora is actually pretty young, but she does have a real depth and breadth of knowledge as a craftsperson. She's done a ton, she's got a ton of formal training behind her and she's been able to combine her highly trained design skills with her broad reaching crafty repairing skills to develop the most beautiful and creative ways of mending garments. I think you'll be totally blown away by her work and like I said now she's got these online tutorials we as amateur knitters can also learn how to beautifully repair and mend. So I think that's a really interesting topic and it's a fun interview. I hope you really enjoy it. And apart from that, Flora is just super charming and gorgeous. So you're going to love meeting her. <laughs> we're also featuring our makers segment. So while we were on the island of Fenu in Denmark, we visited the local craft brewery called Fenu Bruhus. And Andrew interviewed the head brewer. And so normally I'm just not a beer drinker, but I really loved tasting all the different craft beers and learning about the skill that's involved because it's so interesting to see the depth of all the things that you can work with to create a craft beer because you can use different fruits and grains and hops. But you can also use things like coffee and chocolate and even flowers and the complexity of just all of those combinations I think is similar to how we make really beautiful hand-knitted garments. And there's just a, a funny analogy that I thought of. It's a bit silly, but it's just like foodies, like we can use yarns that have different regional influences as well. <laughs> and you can also just compare the all of the, the trial and the effort and then the failing and then the reworking that goes on in both creative processes. Mm -hmm. So for our maker segment, we just love to showcase the skill and creativity of artists and makers outside of the, the knitting world because it's just always pleasurable to watch highly skilled people who are really passionate about their work. So that's about a 10-minute segment. I hope you'll enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and mum and dad actually brought back some beers from Fanu, so I took them with me down here on the train, and here are two of those. Um, you can see they have pretty fun labels. This beer was specifically made for the Fanu Knitting Festival, and you, it's called Knitwit. You can see that it has a ball of wool and two shafts of wheat sticking through them like knitting needles. So yeah, my guess is it's a wheat beer, right? Yeah, definitely. It's yeah. a cool design, isn't it? It's very groovy. And the background has actually got stocking stitch on it. Yeah. But it's, it's, isn't it fantastic to have a beer that's specially done for one for a knitting festival? That's yeah. That's really clever. 
Okay, so apart from that, you might remember in the last episode that I mentioned that I hijacked one of Madeline's projects. Well, I ended up hijacking both of her projects and finishing them, so you can see we're we're wearing them. So we've got a couple of jumpers to talk about in our Bring and Brag segment. And finished projects always means that you get to pick out new projects, so we've got new things to show you as well. So I, I think there should be some fun knitting updates. Yeah. Yeah, so Mum actually managed to hijack both my jumpers Uh, This white one over here by Kim Hargraves, it's a very simple knit, and this jumper by Marie Wallens, which I have to admit I had been working on for ages before that. Um, I wasn't very keen on mum taking over my projects at first, but the truth is I've been quite preoccupied with my studies, and now I actually have two beautiful jumpers that I get to wear, so I am very thrilled about that. And you get to pick out new projects. That's true. (laughs) Okay, so let's tell us about this one. Yes, well, I started knitting this in December last year. It's by Kim Hargraves. It's called Inviting, and you can find it in this book, the yeah. Covered Collection number 7. Uh, the yarn it uses is the Rowan's Brushed Fleece, which is a very light and fluffy but also bulky yarn. So it's a quick knit and also uses 55 millimeter needles. Um, yeah, so I knitted the front and the back before Mum took over. Then Mum did the sleeves and the neck, and she sewed everything together. Um like I said, it's easy. And nevertheless, I managed to make a really dumb mistake. Um, it's but it, funny though. <laughs> yeah, so it was funny. So I had to take a photo of it and here it is. I was watching movies while I was knitting and thus not paying a huge amount of attention. So I mistook my shoulder seam cast off for the underarm shaping. So I ended up doing two sets of armhole shapings, one on top of the other. I couldn't tell the first armhole shaping was there because the stocking stitch had rolled in at the sides. So this is what a jumper might look like if you were knitting it for the Indian god Vishnu, and he has four arms. Yeah, it's pretty funny, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) And I only actually noticed that I was doing this mistake when I uh, had to measure it against my body, because this jumper is supposed to be cropped. You You can can see see here the ribbing is meant to sit in the waist. Well, that's what we modified it to be. And I only noticed something was wrong when I saw how long it had gotten. Yeah, so that was funny, and that was actually the state that it was left in when mum took over my project, so mum had to fix the problem for me. It wasn't that hard. (laughs) No. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so tell us about this one. Yes, this is the Bresser by Marie Wallen, a beautiful jumper. Um, You can find it in her Shetland book, which is this book here, full of gorgeous designs, and all of the designs, they use Jameson's of Shetland Spindrift yarn, which is this wool right here. These, these are the, the leftovers. Yeah, those are the leftovers. So these are the colors that this jumper uses. And you can see they're just beautiful. They are all heathered, have a whole mix of different colors in them, um, and they just blend together so well. Um, what are your favorites? These are my favorites, that one and this. Okay, that's the laurel and that's the paprika. I can't remember that one. That's a pretty brown. This one's my favourite. It's such a a rich Mm -hmm. sort of foresty green. It's moss, I think, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what what needle? Talk about the needles. and Um, Because it's a super fine gauge. It it is a super fine gauge. I knitted it on 2.75 millimetre needles, which is very small, but I actually really like that kind of a gauge because you can see it looks very machine knit. I think it gives it a high quality look. Um, and you also knit it from the bottom up and in the round. Uh, so I knitted the stocking stitch parts on the body and on the arms. And Which I also took got such to do... a long time, didn't it? Yeah. Because um, it's fine knitting, super fine. Yeah. yeah. And the fun part was actually the ferrule, um, which I got some, um, some of. I did the arm on the ferrule and I also did the bodice up to where you join the sleeves to the yeah. body and then do the yoke. So that's what mum did. She did the ferrule on the other arm and then she joined everything together and it did the yoke. So yeah. that's a medium and you made the sleeves longer and the body longer, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, because I'm a tall girl and I have very long arms. <laughs> so I think it's just a completely gorgeous design. It's mm. so impressive looking. So if you love this design and you've had some basic experience with ferrule, I think you could probably use it as your first colour work sweater because it's done in the round so there's no sew, sewing up and there's also no purling. Marie Wallen's designs, probably uh, maybe a third to a half of them, are done in pieces. So you, it, it means you've got a pearl ferrule as well, but there's none of that in this, which is fantastic. It makes it much easier. And it's also true ferrule as in 
every every row only has two colors so all of that is very manageable but it is just so impressive looking isn't yeah. it and being complex and impressive but still being easy to knit is just a lovely combination to have in a design yeah so yeah I'm, I'm thrilled with it I love it I'd love it <laughs> and it was nice to to knit in a in a dark purple like this mm -hmm. so the only modification that I did was add in some short row shaping to raise the back of the neck. What you can normally do on a colorwork yoke sweater, and it's a good good idea to do, is um, to put in a few sets of short row shaping directly after you've joined the sleeves to the body. So we're talking knitting bottom up. So as soon as you've joined the sleeves to the body, you can start about here and you with your with your short row and you knit across the top of the sleeve around the back around the top of this sleeve and you'd finish your four sh your first set about here and then you pull back and you'd start your second set of short rows about six stitches in and and then do another and and depending on your gauge whether it's a really fine gauge or not you could do about three sets of short row shaping underneath before the, co the color work actually starts and what that does is just tilt the yoke up a bit like that and that keeps the back neck higher but I couldn't do it on this design because as you can see if you put your arms out there is quite a lot of color work started on the body and on the sleeves before you join it together and you have to do short row shaping in a plain knitting you can't do it in ferrule so it would have just been this weird sort of stripe going around in the middle disturbing this beautiful design so I did all of my short row shaping at the back of the neck so here's some footage so you can see how the garment sits around the neck. I did around six sets of short rows in the beige after the colour work and I had to keep trying it on to see how many sets I needed to do because I'm slightly different shape than Madeline. The tops of her shoulders are slightly wider than mine so it was hard to predict how it was going to sit on her shoulders but I think it worked out really well. Necklines are just really tricky and I think you do have to be prepared to just rip out and rework them a few times. I would truly say that on every garment that I knit, I'd probably rework part of every neckline. I know we hate to interrupt the flow of our knitting, but it really is worth it. So sometimes I, you know, like we just do a set or two of short rows and then you get undressed and you put it on, you see, yeah, I think, I think I'm filling in this gap here or it's sitting well. And that sort of guides you along and then you think okay I might do another three sets of short rows or whatever. I also try it on a lot just with simply casting off because getting the right tension on casting off a neckline is also difficult. You need to know it can't be too loose and wavy and it can't be too tight and, and puckery. So I will sometimes just cast off that much, try the garment on and see is there enough stretch in that without it being too loose and wavy and, and then take it off again and cast off some more stitches. So I think it really is worth interrupting your knitting and, and taking the time to redo necklines. Because no matter how beautiful your knitting is, your eyes always gonna look here. If, and it feels uncomfortable too, I think. Anyway, this is how they look on us. I think they've turned out really well. But yesterday I went into the forest with Madeline and I took some footage of her modeling them. She looks beautiful in them. So we're gonna show you some footage. And also the, the snow has melted here and you really start to see the beautiful colours of the conifer trees. Yeah, we're actually in the Black Forest right now and the tree trunks are just this lovely rich chocolatey brown while the foliage is a beautiful dark green, which yeah, Mum loves. Sort of like this. Yeah, it's very different to the forests around Frankfurt.
Coming up now is the Makers segment with the Fainu Craft Brewery, Fainu Brewhus, and Dad is actually doing the interview. I think he does a really good job, and it's just so wonderful to see how yeah. fit and healthy he looks. He does. He looks great. Yeah. When I was growing up in Melbourne, I used to train along the banks of the Yarra River with a cross-country running team. It was a great spot to run amongst the trees, along the river, but pretty frequently at this one particular spot there'd be an extremely strong and quite unusual smell. On the other side of the river was Carlton and United Breweries, uh, home of Foster's Lager, Carlton Draft and Victoria Bitter, and we were being hit with the heady aromas of brewing beer. It's the largest brewery in Australia, still in operation, now turning out around 150,000 litres of beer a day. Well, today we're getting a look at the other end of the scale. I'm at the craft brewery Fernu Brewhus with head brewer Steve Rold. Steve, thanks for joining us today on Fruity Knitting. Welcome to Fernu. Thank you. Steve, I know you're not from around here. Tell us, how did you come to be here on Fernu brewing beer? Well, we should probably tackle how I became brewing beer first. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even know brewing was something you could really do until my roommate brought home a homebrew kit his dad gave him. And he came in with all these pots and pans and, and thermoses and stuff, and it just, it really just overtook me. Uh, so I went back to school and I got a degree in fermentation sciences and I just started brewing and, and started brewing in the States. And I am from a small town in Iowa that is actually a Danish settlement. Yep. Uh, so Denmark has always had a special place in my heart. And when the opportunity came, for me to come to Denmark and brew, I just jumped at it. So I've been here for the last five years just brewing beer and, and absolutely loving it. Okay, yeah. that's great. Well, we'll get to your particular beers in a moment, but before we do, could you just walk us through the basic process of brewing beer? Absolutely. So when we're brewing beer, we're starting with malts, which is malted barley or wheat. Uh, and we're mashing that in with hot water, uh, and that starts a process of satrification, which converts those starches that are in those malts into sugars. Um, we then draw off that sweet wort, as we call it, and into the kettle. Uh, we boil it and we add hops. Now hops add mm. bitterness, they add microbiological stability to the beer, and they add uh, aroma. Okay. So depending on when we're using these hops, it adds different characteristics and depending on the kind of hops that we're using, but we can talk more about that later. Um, once we have boiled it, we knock it out, we, we bring that temperature down and we add yeast, and the yeast does the work. It converts those starches, that sweet sugar that we've, we've converted from starches to sugars, now it's converting that sugar into alcohol, mm. and it's making beer. So we allow the yeast to work, and then we cold crash that tank, bring the yeast out, and you have finished beer. Okay, great. So this is a craft brewery, which does mean that you use traditional methods, but it also means you've got the opportunity to experiment with other techniques because you're only ever brewing a small batch of beer at any time. So can you tell us, how do you decide which beers you actually want to make? Absolutely. Well, we get ideas from all over the place, and sometimes some beers come a little faster than others, uh, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. What kind of story are we trying to tell? Are we trying to use specific ingredients, um, or are we trying to do something that's very traditional? Uh, and we use that as a framework, and then we build upon it. So if I have an idea for a stout, but I want to do something new with it, like use an enzyme that dries it all the way out, 
that's a, a unique wrinkle that we'll, we'll try to do, okay. uh, for example. Yep, yeah. yep, and different flavors, and you've got all the different ingredients there. But, uh, you've got different grains that you can actually malt, yeah. haven't yeah. you, and, and different mm -hmm. types of hops. Yeah, so we use, we use a, a wide range of ingredients. Uh, Foster's, for example, uses probably a lot of corn and barley, yep. and they're a very straightforward beer. We're a little more open-ended, so we have barley, uh, which we get from all over, the, all over Europe, uh, and then we have hops that we get from all over the world. And depending on where a hop is grown, it picks up different flavors from the soil, that toir that comes up into the hop. So a, a Chinook hop grown in New Zealand tastes very different from a Chinook hop grown in the Pacific Northwest. Okay. It tastes very different from a Cascade hop. Uh, so we use that and we learn those flavors and we say, this is what we want this IPA to taste like. We want it to be very tropical, very melony, very citrusy. And we'll use certain hops to achieve that. Alternatively, we can also use ingredients like heather or, or rose hips or dried orange peel um, to make different beers and to impart different flavors. Okay. And you can also use different yeast strains, and they, those impart different flavors. Yep. So we explore all those things when we're trying to make a beer be what we envision it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. And, and how long, supposing you've got an idea and you know what you want to do, how long can you... Well, how long does it take to get that oh, beer yeah. to when you can actually taste it? It's, it's, it, it varies so much. If we're yeah. doing a straightforward pale ale, we could probably brew that in about 14 days. Um, if it's something a little more complex, uh, if we're using a natural, natural souring agent, uh, lactobacillus, or if we're putting it into barrels and aging it, um, you really want to give those beers more time. So it can be anywhere from 14 days to 14 months. Um, okay. When you're putting something in a barrel, the longer you leave it in there, the more you're gonna pull out flavors of vanilla or that roastiness if it's a charred barrel, or the, the flavors of wine or bourbon if it's a second use barrel. And yeah. you use that, you kinda know going in, like this is what's going to happen to this beer, this is what we hope is gonna happen to this beer. Yeah. And then you always kinda get a little bit of a surprise at the end, or maybe you're right on the dot, so. Yeah, okay, so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I tell you what, more often than not, it's very close, but yeah. you never really know what you're going to get. And that's part of the fun for me. Like, you can, you can mitigate your risk. It's not going to be undrinkable, but it might not be as chocolatey, or it might be more wine flavor than you ever thought could come out of a barrel. Yeah. Uh, and that's, to me, like, that's the exploration of craft beer. That's what sets us apart from yeah. some of those larger breweries that yeah. aren't doing things like this. Yeah. I, I must say, I've never heard of aging beer in barrels before yeah. and, and getting the taste of wine or whiskey or whatever it might be. Yeah. That's, uh, it's something that really died out when the macro brewery took over yeah. uh, in the last century. And it's, it's finally coming back because the original containers for beer were barrels. And so yeah. it would pick up these, these unique flavors and aromas and bugs and, and bretomyces and, and all that stuff that lives in the wood. Yeah. And so now we're re-exploring that as craft brewers across the planet um, to find those flavors and to work with them and see how they pair with different, yeah. different ingredients. Yeah. yeah. Well, Steve, there's an obvious next step here. I think we should try a couple. You've got a couple of your uh, different brews here, so let's, yeah. let's open a couple let's up. Let's start it. Okay, so first off, we have uh, one of our core beers, and it's actually a pale ale. And this is a traditional American-style pale ale, and it's brewed with Citra, Columbus, Centennial, and Cascade hops. And those hops are all kind of known for their Citra quality. They're, it's like very okay. orange peel. Uh, it has a light bitterness. It's about 60 IBUs. Uh, it's actually one of, it's not my recipe, but it's actually one of my favorite beers. It's, like, it's a good daily drinker, as I like to call it, a uh, good shift beer. That's, that's an interesting taste there. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's, it's slightly more bitter than your, your typical pilsners. Yeah. Um, and it's really good with like braised pork or, or you have like anything that you're grilling, like burgers or hot day. Like this is the beer that it, it's just, you can't really mess up. A yeah, it's a really fresh beer. flavor, that one. Yeah. yeah. Good. So next up, we actually have, this is one of my beers. And this is very different from the pale ale. Uh, this is a beer we call Impeached, and it's a sour beer. So this okay. is a beer that has a naturally occurring lactobacillus yeast strain in it uh, that we put in there and it sours the beer, drops its pH down to create a tartness. Now, to combat that from just being a straight vinegar flavor, we actually age it on oak chips, like some, some whiskey oak chips, mm -hmm. and uh, about 60 kilos of fresh peaches. And we let it sit for about six months, yep. picking up those flavors, continuing to sour until it was ready for packaging. Uh, so it's a little more tart. You'll kind of get a in the side of your jaw on that one. And it's, it's another good beer. It's, uh, what do I have for food pairings on here? Sorry. 
this is a this is a good beer for strong cheeses and seafood, mm -hmm. uh, like fishes. If you have like some fresh fish, something that's from the ocean, we really like kind of yep. recommend that fruitiness combining with like the yep. fish and the like. And stuff. That is really unusual. Yeah. yeah, and you can actually taste taste the the peaches in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's it, just sort of in there. Yeah, it, really it, it's all floating around, and, and it's it's balancing those flavors out, finding finding like what's the right amount of peaches to use and how mm -hmm. long you need to expose the, the beer to it. It's, yep. it's, that's all part of the process. For yep. me. Great. Uh, next up, we actually, this is, a, this is a very special beer for me. Um, this kind of the beer we're, we're becoming more and more known for. And this is an imperial stout uh, brewed with a little bit of coffee and it's aged in red wine barrels for over a year. And this is called Red Wedding. Um, and we've been brewing, this is the third year we're doing it. It's, it's really kind of developed its own cult following. It's, it's got this nice combination of coffee and sweetness from the vanilla in the barrels, but it also picks up that red wine character yep. right in the background. And so That's it's, incredible. It's so much, it, there's oakiness, there's... Yep. there's you actually get the, I think you get the coffee smell mm -hmm. straight away. Yeah. And then the red wine is in there. Yeah. And but it's just so that's soft amazing. On, on the palate, and I just, I, that's one of the ones that sells out fat, like faster than we can make it, and, and so it's something that we are really kind of proud of here. Yep, yep, yep. And finally, Good. we have our Knitwit, which is actually for our knitting festival. Um, so this is a wheat beer that we then brew, and you may notice the color on this. Uh, it's a wheat beer that we brew um, yeah. with about 100 kilos of, of different berries, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries. Uh, we add that during the fermentation process. Right at the end, just as the yeast is getting real tired and is about to be finished, we hit it with 100 kilos of sugary sweetness and yeast, or, uh, berry skins. Yep. And it all kind of goes in there and it changes the color of the beer, but the yeast wakes back up. It eats a lot of that sugar. Okay. So this is like still a very nice dry wheat beer with a lot of fruit forward flavor, a lot of fruit forward flavor. Alrighty. So you're gonna get raspberries and you're gonna get blackberries in there. Um, but this is the one we do specially for the knitwit or for the knitting festival, and uh, people really just seem to enjoy it. Yep, that's interesting too. And again, the smell comes through very quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. just straight off. It's a very light beer. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. Yeah. Uh, a fruity knitting beer. So, and that's your special. You do that every year for the knitting festival. We brew that every year for the knitting festival now. Which is a real shame that it's not happening, although we do know there are plenty of knitters still coming and I'm sure they'll be in to give this a try. So, Steve, that's been a heap of fun trying out these wonderful brews. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate you stopping by. Alrighty, let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. See ya. So welcome back. <laughs> I hope you really enjoyed that segment. If you do decide to go to the Fanu Knitting Festival, you do have to visit the brewery there. And if you see Steve, say hello to him because the, their beers are just fantastic. You'll really enjoy them. I My favourite was the Red Wedding, which was the coffee and red wine flavouring. But we've just opened up the Knitwit beer here. And that is raspberries and blueberries and blackberries. That's why it's got such a, a rich color here. It's also uh, Columbus hops for those of you who are into beer. And it pairs well with baked brie and fruit desserts. So there you go. Cheers. Cheers. So one of the reasons, mm. well, the main reason why I hijacked Madeline's projects was that I'd finished all of my projects and as you know, I don't have a stash. I have accumulated a lot of leftovers, but I don't have a st um, quantity, jump, jumper quantities worth of yarn available. And with everything that's going on with Germany's lockdown and then Andrew getting really critically ill, I just couldn't source jumper quantities worth of yarn. So and I needed easy, mindless projects to work on. Anyway, 
John and Juliet Arben from John Arben Textiles in the UK have sent me a jumper's quantity of one of my favourite yarns. It's their yarn, the Devonia DK, in this really beautiful salmony pink colour. I was really hoping to have it available now to show you on the podcast, but Germany's post is just really slow at the moment. So I'll just have to show you pictures. And I'm going to knit a very simple, stylish design by Kim Hargraves. It's also from this book, Covet. In fact, I've shown you on the podcast before because Andrew was originally going to knit it for me. Here it is. It's called Devote, and the recommended yarn is the Rowan's Alpaca Soft DK, which is a really gorgeous yarn, but with the lockdown, it was just much harder for me to get. And as many of you know, I like my jumpers to fit me in the waist, which this one will do, which is great. And I also really like the shawl collar, which is in garter stitch. I'm not normally a fan of garter stitch unless it's knitted at a very fine gauge. But I really love the way Kim Hargraves uses garter stitch. She always manages to make what I think of as a slightly ugly stitch just look really elegant. So the design is constructed by knitting the two front stocking stitch pieces separately, decreasing up as you go just to give it the shaping. And then at the end, you knit the garter stitch shawl collar separately and sew it on. There is a fair bit of sewing in this design, but that's quite typical of Rowan patterns and also Kim Hargraves designs. But I like sewing, so that won't be a problem. Okay, now there is one other design I want to show you about. I, I Because my yarn still hadn't arrived, I asked Madeline to bring down this kit of yarn that I had for me to start working on. So I suppose it was a bit of a white lie to say that I didn't have a jumper's quantity worth of, of yarn. But this was a kit that I bought in... Fanu, it's a crystal Seifarth design, this, this jacket here. It's a female jacket, but when I saw it, I totally fell in love with the colour work material that she's done. It is so beautiful. I think if I remember correctly, she based it on a kimono design. And when I saw it, I thought this will look stunning on Andrew. So my plan is to make this into a male vest, a vest for Andrew. It's going to be called his full recovery vest. That's to spur him on to, to get cracking with full recovery. <laughs> so I think he'll look stunning in it. It's, it's just so unique. So here's all the colours. The problem is, though, I do have to do a lot of thinking with that design. I've got to really start off calculating and, and figure out how I'm going to do the shaping and what I'm going to do for the ribbing, etc. And I just didn't want to do that. I just wanted mindless knitting right now. But the colours are stunning. You may mm. not see this, but that is a really deep purple. That's a rich blue. That's more of a cobalty blue. This is um, a deep teal. So you've got all these lovely dark, richy colours. That's a very dark blue. And a lot of them actually glow in a way, especially that one blue that you showed beforehand. Yeah, that's it's very bright. stunning. And these are more these sort of grey blues. And then you've got some very interesting sort of beiges. So it's a definitely a stunning colour work piece, and I think Andrew will look great in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to him wearing it with a lot of energy. <laughs> So I have been trying to keep fruity knitting the fruity knitting channel going through Andrew's illness and a couple of weeks ago we did have a live event here in the clinic a live online event um, with Julie Weisenberger the founder of Coco Knits so we set it up I had a little table right next to Andrew's bed and the nursing staff were fantastic I asked them not to come in <laughs> So that just like now while we're recording, I said, please don't let anyone come in, no doctors, no nurses, no cleaners, just so that we can record. And they've been fantastic. And I, I bumbled through that event um, without Andrew's help on the technical side of things, but that managed, we managed that well and it was a good, good event. That was for our Shetland uh, patrons. And we have another event coming up with the personality and designer Stephen B. That'll be on February the 13th, I think it's a Saturday. So that'll be fun as well, and it'll be here in the clinic, and hopefully I'll manage the tech, the technical side of that as well. I'm sure you will. You've been doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a steep learning curve for me. Stephen has a two-story reclaimed firehouse in Minneapolis, which he's turned into a fantastic yarn shop. It looks like a wonderful place to visit. And Stephen is very kindly offering fruity knitting patrons 
a 15% discount off all the products from their online store. And he stocks a really interesting and diverse selection of designer yarn brands from Friars Hand Painted Magic Balls, there's the Fibre Company, there's Hedgehog Fibres, Juniper Moon Farm, to bigger brands like Rowan and Barocco, and also some Australian hand dyes. So there's a lot to enjoy looking through. Stephen's also offering a 50% discount off all Stephen B digital designs. So thank you so much to Stephen, and we're really looking forward to the live event with him and the Shetland patrons. So coming up very soon is our interview with Flora Collingwood Norris. And as I said, she has a real depth of, of technical knowledge behind her and, and training from her tertiary studies. But she was also brought up in a very crafty and arty family. So she's just got fantastic designs and you'll be blown away by her mending skills. You can see here some of her amazing weaving patterns that she uses to repair holes in garments. They're really special and beautiful. So if you'd like to learn how to do fantastic, inspiring mends on your woolens, then you definitely need to check out Flora's tutorials. And Flora is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount off her digital mending workshop. So the details for both discounts with Flora and Stephen B are, as usual, on our Patreon site. Okay, so now we're going to go over and uh, wake Andrew up and spruce him up a little bit because he wants to say hello to you. I hope you've enjoyed seeing this plate of fruit here. I have to point it out for you because I asked the kitchen staff if they would mind putting some fruit together so we could have it on our table. I can't it, wait to get into it once I've finished. <laughs> it looks really scrumptious. It's really gorgeous. There's mango and raspberries and melons and mm -hmm. kiwi fruit and passion fruit and, and pineapple. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we'll see you soon with Andrew. So here we are all together. Yeah, so just a really quick update from me. Really, we're pushing on day by day. Um, I have a bit of a ritual each day. It covers things like eating, um, which is going really well. I actually get through most of my meals. Yeah. Which I think is a really, really good thing. And certainly something that's got a lot better over the last few months, so I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, tablets and sprays and drinks and so many Infusions things. Infusions and... One thing, yeah, infusion, one thing after another. Um, I am having some, some serious treatment, which is going really well. Um, but something I've seen is that everyone's course through cancer or something like this is really different, and I can certainly see that my course is not the worst imaginable, but it does have its own challenges. In general, I can get through day by day, but there are some moments when things are hard and I sort of get down to shorter periods of time. And I'm really depending on not having support from Andrea and also the well wishes that come in from, from our viewers to help me through some of those difficult times. So I'm so, so grateful. And I really have to say to other people, going through an experience like this, our blessings, my blessings, go out to you and all the support that I can offer you and, and encouragement and determination. I have found that I am a bit emotional at the moment. Um, I think things are, you know, I've been sick for four months now, um, but I am positive. I'm staying determined and Sticking it up. Yeah, you've got your full recovery vest to wear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're sticking with it. So thank you again for the support. It's so, so appreciated. Yeah. And uh, in the last video we opened, I, I talked about the PayPal account that we had and asked our viewers to contribute something small towards Andrew's medical expenses so he could have more specialised treatment and have a chance of survival. Many of you did do that and we are so grateful and we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you did do that. That is so special for us and it gives us hope and yeah, so thank you deeply from all three of us that, yeah. that you have done that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So the, we're still waiting or the doctors are still waiting for certain tests to come back. So we don't know what the full treatment plan is going to be. That sort of is going to take a while and it show, and it depends on what shows up in his 
in his biopsy tissue on certain, I don't quite understand it. Mutations. But different mutations. Some results have come in and others they're still waiting for, and that'll, that'll determine the course, the full course of treatment that he gets. But I have to say that all, everybody here, from the doctors to the nursing staff, even the cleaners and, and the kitchen staff, everybody is very upbeat and positive, and that's just such a lovely thing yeah. when, when you're you know, around people who are really treating with, treading on dark life and death. It's, it's a wonderful atmosphere to be in, and, and yeah. we're really happy about that. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's, it's been interesting meet lots of different oncologists, and I, I have to respect them all, but it, in some situations it's quite clear that's not the person for you to work with. Um, yeah. So yeah. We, I am... Very, very grateful for the people here. Yeah. 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 So coming up now is a fun interview with Flora Collingwood-Norris. We hope you really enjoy it. We hope to see you soon. So thank you for spending time with us again. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. Our interview today is with Flora Collingwood Norris, a very talented UK designer who's making knitwear for her own label. We met Flora at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival and apart from creating stunning designs, she also has a very impressive CV. So after studying design for textiles at the Harriet Watt University, she worked as a knitwear designer for different fashion houses and also as a part-time knitwear lecturer before moving back to the Scottish borders to start her own company. Flora is also a very skilled hand knitter and recently she started a series of online courses in visible mending to encourage people to creatively mend their own clothes. So Flora, it's really great to have you with us. So thanks for giving us your time. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. So you started your own knitwear company, Collingwood Norris, in 2016. And um, I know that you learnt to knit when you were six years old, but could you fill out my introduction a little bit more and tell us how you got from crafting as a child to starting your own small business? Yes, of course. Um, my mum started teaching me to knit and sew when I was about five or six years old. And I also learnt at school and I went to a Steiner school which placed quite a lot of emphasis on creativity for my first few years. So I learnt knitting and sewing and some embroidery there. Um, my mum had also had a small knitwear business before I was born, um, creating her own feral knitwear designs um, on her domestic knitting machine. So I was used to the sound of the knitting machine and sometimes she would knit us jumpers and I would get to play with her tools. So that was, you know, a bit of sort of things going on in the background of my childhood. I used to spend a lot of time teaching myself new stitches and techniques from old stitch dictionaries my grandpa used to give me from his book sales. Um, and I also had bobbin lace making lessons for a while when I was about eight or nine. And I think I knitted my first hand knit jumper when I was 10. So I think I've given you a photo of me wearing it on my 11th birthday with pride. Uh, it was my foundation art course where I realized that I really loved knitting all the time before I'd thought that I wanted to go and do fashion and clothing of some kind. Um, but it was during my foundation course that I did a project that was knitting and crochet based and I realised that I loved doing it full time. 
Um, I also found out that I could do a course in textiles, which I hadn't really known about as opposed to fashion. So it was much more fabric and texture based. And that was where I was going to be able to specialise in knit. As you mentioned, I did my degree at Heriot Watt University in Galashiels, um, which has strong links to the, the mill and the textile heritage industry in the borders, as well as having great facilities and good links to industry. And the course had much more of a, a technical focus than some of the sort of more art courses which was what I wanted. So I really wanted to learn the technical side of knit, how to you know, calculate my own garments um, and how to use the knitting machines, which, you know, although mum had one, I hadn't learnt as a child. So my final collection at uni was a series of fine gauge knitted dresses. So I have one here that you can see a bit of. Um, I was really exploring playing with scale and combining fine gauge knits um, with my sort of chunky embroidery and crochet. So this dress has really fine crochet, which you can see in the middle, but also really chunky um, embroidery and really chunky crochet, which was all done using strapping that I knitted myself. It's amazing. <laughs> Thanks. Um, they were sort of, they're not practical to wear because the, the yarn's so heavy at the bottom. It's almost a kilo of cashmere per dress. So, but they, you know, they were great fun to create. And they look fantastic on the, on the <laughs> runway. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so after university, I did a placement with People Tree. I was their intern for seven months. Um, they're a fair trade fashion company, and I became really interested in ethical fashion at university. Um, I was really lucky I was able to design some of their accessories, contribute to their main garments, and also go out to Nepal to meet the women who work for them there, which was amazing to see how they work. After that, I ended up working freelance. Um, I've done a range of different jobs for different companies, but all knitting related. I started with swatch design, which is where you design and make a mini garment front, which is then sold on to companies from Louis Vuitton to H&M, and they can use those designs however they want. They then own them. And it was, it was really great in some ways because it was very creative. I was knitting, you know, using all the skills that I enjoy doing, machine knitting, hand knitting, embroidery, crochet, I could use all of those. But it, it still made me feel uncreative because there was this pressure to create a design a day, pretty much. Um, and I also knew that I was, you know, a lot of these designs were being sold to companies that have no particular ethics. So I was contributing to fast fashion through that to an extent. Um, I then started um, creating catwalk samples for Christopher Kane, Jasper Conran and House of Holland, which I've done over you know, several years for the different companies. Um, I did all the crochet for Christopher Kane's Autumn Winter 11 liquid collection, which included um, a crochet biker jacket. And also I also managed some of the crochet production with crochets all over the UK. So were you learning more skills while you were doing that or you were just, you'd already learnt those skills? Um, I would say all of my freelance work, in every piece there have been new skills that I've learnt because often someone goes, can you do this? And it'll be something that I've never done before but if I think it's within you know, my range of capabilities, I say yes and I work it out as I go. So <laughs> the joy of the catwalk sample work was that I'd often get given, I mean the joy and the stress of it really, I'd often be given a new piece to make and be told, you know, could you have this biker jacket done in three days? And I would never have seen, you know, the pattern before. I'd never have made one. I had to work it out and make it within the three days and send it back. So it was always, it was always a bit tense, but really exciting. So, so Absolutely. I it. But I could imagine you'd get a burnout fairly quickly at working at that pace. It was, I, you know, I couldn't have done it without the help of my mum and, you know, family who at times cooked for me. You know, I'd go and stay with mum and she would hand me breakfast and I'd crochet and then she'd hand me lunch and I would crochet and she'd hand me supper and I would crochet. And I, I did about, you know, 14 to 16 hours work a day for, for months on end um, to the point where I think I had a sort of repetitive strain injury. But yeah, but one of the, one of the pieces I created for Jasper Conran was a, an orange crochet top and it took me over 100 hours to make. So I still think it's one of the most fabulous pieces that I've made. And it's, you know, it's wonderful to be able to work on projects that sort of don't have a limit on how long you can spend on them. Definitely. Okay, so after you finished university, you had a stint in London to pursue your career and then you returned to the Scottish borders because you wanted to work for yourself and start your own company. 
Can you, um, why did you choose to come back to the Scottish borders? Like I know there is a history and tradition of textile production there. Could you talk a little bit more about that and also talk about your studio setup? Describe how you've done it. I came back to the Scottish borders and Galashiels in particular because I've got family in the area and when I moved I was doing some freelance work for local companies. Uh, I decided to start Collingwood Norris because I was fed up of working for being at the mercy of other designers' whims basically and felt ready to test my design abilities under my own name. Um, I really wanted to create a business that put, you know, values the people and the skills that are part of it and doesn't contribute to disposable fashion, fashion trends. Initially, I wanted to um, design men menswear because I thought that might be a nice route to sustainability as they tend to want longer lasting garments. But I realised that I love trying pieces on and seeing how they fit and working them out and, you know, ultimately wearing them. So. It's taken a while to figure out exactly what Collingwood Norris would be, but this, this feels like the right time and the place to do it. Um, it's great being in the Scottish borders to, to run this business. I mean, it's, it's ideal actually for me, partly because I know, I know some of the people who work here, but also there's a, a long textile history in the Scottish borders. It started in the 1700s with hosiery and stocking machines in Hoyk, um, and that changed to combination garments and that then became outerwear with brands like Pringle being particularly famed for twin sets at the time. Um, nearly a third of the border's labour force used to work in the textile industry in the 1940s. But wow. With cheap... Yeah, I know, it's amazing, isn't it? And I mean, Gala Shields used to be full of mills and it... Gala Shields and Selkirk specialised in tweeds and wovens um, rather than knitwear. But now all that industry is gone because of cheap overseas manufacturing. So in Gala Shields, we've got one finisher left and a couple of small design businesses like me, but otherwise, e you know, even the mill buildings mostly don't exist. Except um, Bernard Klein what lived and worked in the borders and his old factory building, Neverdale, is where the Herrick Watt textile building now is. Um, they, that's what they use. So that's a nice link to the designers of the past and the sort of designers of the future. Um, but Hoik still has sort of some of the remaining mills and they're still producing world-class knitwear. So Chanel own one of them now and they're producing for luxury brands. Um, so it's, it's great to sort of contribute to, you know, part the continuation of that industry, even in my very small way. And I now, I now work with one of the, the smaller mills who produce some of my designs in small batches. So how's your setup? What, what does your setup look like and what, how is it, um, how big is it? I work from a home studio, so I have, I have one room that's at the top of the building with sloping ceilings. So it's a little bit, it's getting more cramped by the year because I can't have shelves really because, because of the ceilings. So all my yarns crammed under tables. I've got two tables, two knitting machines permanently set up. You can see a little bit of one behind me. I also now have an old industrial linker, which I invested in last year, which came from one of the mills that has recently closed down. Um, in the corner, I also have a large chair that can fit me and, you know, the dog sometimes if she's willing to share with me. <laughs> um, so it's all very compact. Oh, I also have an, a steam iron here, so I can, I can pretty much do everything in one room. It's just a bit like those little puzzles you get as a child where you have to move the squares around to make the picture. Um, that's what it feels like when I'm trying to find things out of boxes. <laughs> but, but it's great and it suits me really well and I have lots of windows, so it's very nice and light. Um, and I love it here. That's great. So. Okay, now in your blog, you actually wrote that at university you picked knitwear because you loved the idea of uh, making the material and the garment at the same time. Now, you can also do that with hand knitting and you are a really good hand knitter, but what's the attraction for you of making material on a knitting machine? Can you talk a little bit more about your love of knitting machines and also talk about the industrial uh, knitting machine that you're using, I think it was built in the 60s. So what are, is its um, capabilities? What, are, what is it capable of? Yeah, um, well, I, I love machine knitting. I mean, I love machine and hand, hand knitting. They both have different things that they're great for. One of the obvious advantages of machine knitting is that it's a lot faster than hand knitting. So for me to co produce commercially priced work, it's much easier to make them on the, on the knitting machine in my V-bed than to hand knit. Yes. Um, and like you said, well, my machine was probably made in the 60s, but they, they actually stopped making them in the 60s. 
These, these V-beds are now considered obsolete technology as far as the industry goes. So they're still used in universities and by small designers like me, but not really in industry. And my machine, I love it. I have a four feed, 12 needle Dubier V-bed is what it's called. So Dubier is the make. Um, I have 12 needles per inch. So it produces a really fine gauge, um, fine lightweight fabric. And I'm particularly lucky with mine that it's got an attachment for an auto cam which means I can sort of, uh, I've got little kind of metal dots that I can put in and program my patterning to make it slightly faster, which, you know, it might only be sort of fractionally faster, but it makes a really big difference in terms of what I can make. Um, what else about it? I mean, it's huge. It's a big cast iron beast. You can't even quite see the top of it. So I have to stand to work at it. And these machines, I mean, they're so old, they get, you know, once you have one, they get quite personal. So you really notice if something feels even ever so slightly different or if it sounds different, you know, which is always a heads up of a problem. Is it, it difficult to repair them? It can be quite complex, I think. I'm not, I can only sort out so many problems, but again, it's one of the benefits of me being in the borders is that one of the very few specialists in these machines lives nearby in Hoik. So if I have a problem, he can come normally fairly quickly unless he's out of the country dealing with somebody else's. Um, so that, yeah, there aren't very many people who can fix them or restore them. Um, but the V-beds have, they've got different pattern capabilities to my domestic machines, which I also have. The domestics can produce um, fair isle and intarsia patterns with, with punch cards. So you've got much more sort of flexibility about what your patterning is. And I think, is it what, 24 stitches wide you can do on a domestic with a punch card, which is what my machine has. Um, whereas with my V-bed, I've got different types of needles. I have high butt and low butt needles, and they determine the pattern. And once they're set up, you can't really change them midway through your knit. So you're really sort of limited to those two, two patterning options. Okay, so it's more for fast production. Yeah, and it's, it's also for lighter weight. I mean, it's such a fine gauge fabric that I produce that I wouldn't ever want to hand knit that. I mean, I, I would say it's, it's smaller than two millimetre knitting needles. So... Um, so it's considerably finer and yeah, and so it's considerably quicker to make it by, by machine. Wow, beautiful. Um, but it still feels like, you know, I would still count my products as handmade because I still have to physically move the carriage across the machine. I'm still having to put the, uh, the knitting on the linker and link it. I still sew everything by hand. I hand wash my pieces. I press them, I hand label them. So it's still a huge amount of precision and craftsmanship and sort of handmade process goes into my pieces. So when I actually look at your designs, one thing that really stands out to me is the very distinctive colour palette and particularly like the, the garment that you're wearing, I particularly love that one. Thanks. <laughs> so what's the inspiration for your colours and how, what's your aims when you're selecting colours to work with? A lot of my colours were initially inspired by my childhood holidays to Mull and Iona where they have beautiful clear turquoise waters and I always love the various shades of blues and sort of aquas in the water. So a lot of my, my blue colours come from that. Um, they also have white sandy beaches, lovely carpets of flowers, whether they're buttercups or birds but trefoil, which are all yellows, um, and then sort of corally pinks of the boys for fishing. Um, so you'll see here some of the blues, they're all slightly more sort of marine acri blues rather than sky blues. And the colours on Mull, you know, if you get a, if you get a wonderful day, they're like nothing else you can imagine. I think they're, they're just absolutely inspiring and, and beautiful because of all the blue of, of the water around for me. But you also get many grey days. So I do have some grey scarves called Mist and Storm that remind me of those wet, squelchy walks we used to have when I was little where I whinged the whole way around. Um, so, <laughs> so there's a little bit of both. There's the happy side and there's also the sort of the dreech Scottish weather side um, that people might imagine. Um, my business, I try not to follow seasonal trends. I don't want to be part of disposable fashion. So I pick colours that I really enjoy and I think that, I, and I hope that other people enjoy wearing rather than following seasonal trends in terms of pattern and colours that, you know, will only potentially be around for a little while. So let me show you a few of my designs. Um, the first one I'd point out is the jumper I'm wearing. Um, I also have one on the mannequin. Um, these are my women's sweaters that I used to make myself on my V-bed, but I just can't make them in time really, or it, it quick enough for them to be commercial. 
So these are some of the pieces that are now outsourced to the local mill who can make them in small batches. So I've designed them to be quite a relaxed shape. Um, they've got a drop shoulder, a slightly scoop neck, um, and, a, and a split at the side. So they're meant to be quite nice and relaxed and they're so lightweight that they can be a really nice all season piece for me. The next piece I wanted to show you was um, an intarsia scarf. This is one of my newer designs. And this is designed um, by playing with my nephew and his building blocks. He's three, so we play a, lo a lot with building blocks. Um, and it's a double-sided scarf. It's got the same pattern on both sides. And it's made on the digital knitting machines, the Shima machines that the factory have. And this was um, a really interesting piece to work on because it was the first time that I've really been able to make the most of having access to someone else's facilities and designing a piece that I couldn't make in the studio. So I started, um, I can still sample pieces. So I started by knitting a sample which looks the same, but because it was made on my domestic, it's very much got a front and back. And it's always a challenge with scarves, I think, to make them look nice on both sides so they don't look too, too one-sided and don't really have to worry about wearing them. Yeah. So initially I tried, this was the very first prototype, I wanted to add texture in. So I don't know how well you can see that, but it's got moss stitch and it's got some garter stitch panels and just different sort of reversings of the colorway. Ah. But it, it didn't really work because the joins between the colors, I mean, you can see it in some places, they're not very neat. And there were so many ends on the back because with Intarsia, every block of color has two ends. That the, it took 40 minutes for the mill just to trim it down to this and they weren't prepared to go any further. So then we had to discuss what else we could do to make it a nice product. And the technician worked a way of tucking in the yarns so that they can start knitting, but that the yarn can be pulled out to make the, the finishing quicker. And we, and we did the pattern on both sides, which makes it much more wearable and was a much better option for me than having something like, like a bird's eye pattern, which sort of smushes all the colors together. And yes. again, just gives you more of a front and back. So that's one of my more recent designs. Yeah, it's um, beautiful. And it's, it's huge. So it's really designed to make a statement. I think if you're gonna wear lots of pattern and color, you might as well really go for it and go big. <laughs> it's my idea with that one. And this is one of my newer scarves. Um, it's my original scarf design. Um, I started my business with just six colorways of these. But this year I'm introducing colors inspired by my local landscape. So the Eildon Hills, which is what this scarf is named after, are an iconic three peaks that can be seen for miles around here. So I've got sort of gorsy greens and heathery purples um, and I've also introduced a circle scarf version of it with sort of a yellow, a sort of gorse yellow and a blaberry flower pink. We've also got lots of pink soil around here. So that's, these are some of my new colorways, which I wouldn't normally have done, but I had time during lockdown and I actually really like them. Getting back to the garments, you do garments for men and women. Uh, yes. Is it, um, how, what's menswear like? Because in the hand knitting industry, a lot of designers d sort of leave that area alone because they don't find that their patterns are really selling for male knitters. I like doing menswear. Um, I, you know, I, I really enjoy knitting the men in my life jumpers. So, you know, my dad wears his with pride. Um, and I do, uh, you know, the menswear is a, it's a longer version of this jumper, really, um, with a crew neck. Um, and I do it in three colorways at the moment one of which is grey, so that's very wearable and the pattern isn't so obvious that it's something that men wouldn't wear. It's enough to be a pattern and to keep me interested, but not so much that they feel like, you know, that would put them off. Yeah. <laughs> so, which is always the issue, isn't it? It's yes, like, how it can seems I, to be. How can I add pattern into menswear without them minding? That's the, <laughs> that's the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay, so you're also directing your design skills towards visible mending. And you do that by both offering a mending service yourself and by teaching other people how to mend their own garments in a creative way. So how did you come upon that idea? And um, why are you concentrating on visible as opposed to invisible mending? I first came across the concept of visible mending from seeing Celia Pym and Tom of Holland's work. And I, have a, I find it really difficult to throw out good quality knitwear just because of a hole or a stain. You know, I'm a, I'm a jumper hoarder, basically. So I was very motivated to create a mend that I would be happy to wear. And it's, I mean, it's so hard to find the right color of yarn to do an invisible repair. 
and to get it, you know, sometimes if, if it's a lightweight knit and you, you've repaired it and you've used the right stitches, but it, you can still tell that it's there because it looks thicker. So I'd rather have something that's really obviously a design rather than a, a little spot that people might notice. Um, so that's why I've chosen visible mending. And I, I try to, t um, to treat each of my repairs as a design project. Well, that's how I think of them. So it's a really nice overlap between my design skills and something very practical. Um, I always, I'm always considering colour and proportion and balance and how it sort of reads visually in my designs. And I now sort of think of it as design-led mending rather than, you know, just visible mending. Because I think you can really, really have fun with it. And I'm very lucky with my, um, with my visible mending service that my customers pretty much allow me free reign in terms of design. Although I do consult them on colour because I think that's really important and it can often be really personal. Can you show us some examples of, of maybe some of the more um, abstract or creative designs that you've done for customers? Um, well, I can show you some of the pieces I've done for myself. Yes. Because the ones for the customers obviously They've I don't got have. theirs. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so this, this blue jumper is one of my um, first real sort of creative projects for myself. Um, it's a cashmere sweater my mum found in a charity shop about 20 years ago, I think, and I've been wearing it on and off since then. She's got a real eye for finding cashmere in shops. So it had worn elbows and a stain at the front. And I, oh, mum used to collect old tea cosies, which had lots of vintage embroidery. And I love the, that style of old floral vintage embroidery. So that's what this is inspired by. And I wanted the elbows to look almost like sort of individual picture frames of flowers. And a bit like the issue with matching threads, I think it's almost impossible to make two elbow repairs exactly the same, partly because you wear them in different ways. So then, you know, maybe one of my arms is slightly longer. So they're, you know, in slightly different places and they're not, you know, not the same distance from the seam and without counting stitches. So I wanted, you know, I wanted them to be related, but, um, but different so that they're connected, but, so what are some of the, the embroidery stitches that you've used on that one? Well, I've used Swiss darning to actually repair the knit. So that's the green that you can see. And that has just reinforced the knit. And I've also used, um, I use a lot of French knots. Um, I use a lot of, what is it, stems? No, I don't use stem stitch. I use fly stitch. And I think it's sort of a buttonhole stitch for the flowers. Um, daisy stitch. And did you make up that design yourself? Did you kind of sketch it first and then think, oh, this is how, like, how, how experienced are you in embroidery? Well, I've been doing it since I was about six. Wow, so, so, so a I'm, lot. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty confident. Um, it doesn't mean I know all the stitches or I particularly know their names, but I'm happy to just go for it. Um, and I design as I go along, generally. I, I always work freehand. I never, I never draw anything on. Sometimes if it's more complex, I might sketch something or I might, you know, tack round an elbow sort of spot to keep me on track. Or I think for this one, I did tack a line, but just, you know, just one V to kind of keep me sort of in place. So I knew where I was going. Wow, that's great. And then I have this other piece. This was another old cardigan my mum found and I managed to rip it when I was knitting. With my auto cams, I've got little ramps that have pointy bits on them and I... I caught my sleeve and ripped a hole. So that was the start of the mending on this one. And then I noticed that it had lots of little stains on the front. So you can hopefully see lots of little spots. Yes. Um, as well as some worn bits under the buttons. So I took them off and I actually covered the buttons with essentially darning um, ah. and made cover buttons for it, which just ties the piece together as more of a, a sort of uh, what am I looking for? Deliberate design, which yeah. I think is the challenge of visible mending because the holes are often in places where you wouldn't want them. I, yeah, I think it's a really interesting challenge to make it look deliberate or potentially make it look like it's part of a bigger design. Yes, I'm sure if I met you, I would be really looking at that and, and wondering, is that, is that a, just an amazing, unique design or has she embroidered that or what? Well, that, you know, that's my aim, you know, if you, can, yeah. if you can mend it in a way that makes you feel like you've got a new piece in your wardrobe, then that's brilliant because not only have you repaired something and not had to buy something new, you've, you know, you feel like you've got this whole new piece that you want to show off to the world, um, which is really exciting. I've also, you know, I have been really lucky. I've had some great um, mending commissions. I had a 40-year-old cardigan in sort of bright pink with a slightly fair isle design, and it was, you know, it was much loved and 
the woman had tried to repair it in places herself, but it had worn cuffs and worn elbows and worn button bands. And I was able to repair them with Swiss darning to keep the pattern, but make it look like an obvious repair. Now, you do have some video tutorials on mending. Can you give our viewers some basic advice on mending just to encourage them to get started to mend their own garments and then talk us through some of the downloadable tutorials that you're offering? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think the first thing is that I think anyone can do visible mending. I'd say just go for it and have fun. That's the main thing. Um, but in terms of tips, I would say start small, pick a small hole to begin with. Don't start with a, you know, a major rip at a cuff or something that's much harder. Um, small holes are easier to start with and I think they also offer in many ways more options for creativity because if you want to keep them as a whole for example it's much easier with something small than it is with large so so start small. I think materials matter when it comes to mending so if you're mending something that's wool try and choose a wool to mend it with. If you're mending cotton try and choose cotton so match the fibres if you can. Um, it's not an absolute must there are fibres that work well together like wool and other hair fibres such as cashmere or alpaca. You know, if you've got a cashmere sweater but you can't get hold of any cashmere to mend with, then, then wool is fine because it will wash the same way, whereas wool and cotton are not such a good mix. So I would, you know, think about what you're using to mend with. And also the weight of yarn is important. For me, I like my men's, you know, much like this, this top, you know, the men's are, they're fine to match the fine knit. So they, they don't stand out in a bulky, in a bulky way. So that if you can find the same weight of yarn, I think that really helps. Again, it's not an absolute must if you're not darning socks, for example, where you don't want a bulky bit. Um, it doesn't matter too much, but the main thing is that you catch all the stitches around the hole so that nothing unravels. So whatever you're using, that's something to bear in mind. Um, I often get asked what needles I use for mending. For my darning work, I always use a tapestry needle as I find that doesn't catch the threads when I'm weaving, which can be a problem with the pointy needles. They often catch and then it's much harder to make your mend look neat. And I'm all about my mends looking neat. So for me, that's, that's why I use a tapestry needle. Um, and then I would say when it comes to colour, choose colours you love. You know, this is, if it's for you, it's personal and you don't have to worry what, about what anyone else is doing. Visible mending can be whatever you want it to be. So you can, yeah, use colours you love, turn it into a dinosaur, a lace hole, a flower, a nicely done spot, whatever you want. Um, it's about what you will feel comfortable wearing. And I think that's really important to remember. I often get asked by people, you know, what colour should I be using? What should I be doing for this? Whatever you like, you know, it's, you have to wear it at the end of the day. So make sure it's something that you love. Then in terms of the guides that I offer. I have one guide for Swiss darning, which is, um, it's also known as duplicate stitch. So it's a great sort of embroidery way of mimicking the knitted stitch. And I find it really useful for knitwear. It's great because you can add pattern, you can reconstruct knit if you want to. So if you've got a hole in an elbow and you want to recreate it as knit, Swiss darning is the one to use. But it's also great for reinforcing worn elbow worn elbows or worn areas of knit as you can stitch over the existing pattern. So it's great if you can catch areas before they become holes. Yeah, okay. So is that better for threadbare areas rather than complete holes? Because if you've got a complete hole in the middle, how, you can't really um, duplicate stitch, can you? No, but there are, you know, my, my, uh, my guide does cover how to reconstruct it. So you can re reconstruct the knit using that technique. Okay. But, but it is ideal if you've got something threadbare to catch it first. Um, and I, would, I normally only use it on threadbare areas unless it's a chunky knit or a really small hole because reconstructing a very fine knit using Swiss darning is really fiddly and I don't find it enjoyable. So I save it for, you know, this grey cardigan is quite thick. So I, I reconstructed the elbows on this using Swiss darning um, and then reinforced around them with that. So I also think it's a great technique for knit because it will have the same give as the knitted fabric. So, it, I mean, it's ideal, again, for elbows that will, have, will always sort of have some movement to them where you might be stretching it a bit. Whereas, you know, darning doesn't matter so much on flatter areas of your, of your garment that won't be under strain, but Swiss darning is great for those areas that will. 
And would you suggest that that's a good technique for people to start with if they've never done any mending? Is that like what you would introduce a beginner to? I introduce it only as sort of reinforcement for beginners. I don't introduce the reconstructing fabric because that's definitely more complicated. But on your tutorials, you've got step by step how to do it all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I've got the option of photos and written descriptions of sort of step by step guides, but I also have the option of videos. And I've created a, a workshop that covers um, darning, Swiss darning. I've got some little samples here. So my workshop covers all of these techniques, which includes Swiss darning or duplicate stitch. And it has videos for the darns and, and duplicate stitch so that it's really extra clear. And this year I've also been, I've been doing a lot of weaving, just find all my samples. So I've been experimenting with pattern within darning. And this is my little sampler that whenever I have time, I've been sitting down and trying, trying something new, basically. Um, and it, I'm finding it really fun because just with changing a few colors, you can change the pattern and create something that looks different. So amazing. Thank you. Whenever I'm playing with this, I'm always keeping in mind that it needs to be a practical darn. So it has to, you know, there can't be floats that are too long because they'll make the fact, you know, the darn less stable. So it's all within a, um, within the constraints of mending. Okay. And that's what you call micro weaving, isn't it? Yeah, because they're, they're always going to be small scale, but, um, but it is definitely really weave structures. And um, so again, I've got a guide for that and it's, it's really a guide aimed at getting people creative because not only do I want them to, you know, start playing with pattern, but I want to help them vary their darning and then get creative on their own. So it should, should help people to do that, I think. Yeah, they're just completely stunning little patterns and you could really go to town. You might even put some extra ones in whether you've got holes or not. <laughs> well, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's part of, I'm going to get this blue piece out again, but you know, even a small, a small dot or a stain, you can just, you can keep adding and you can then make it, you know, with the dots on the front, part of the design feature. And if you wanted to carry on or have them on the other side so that it looks more deliberate, you can just keep going. And I think it's, you know, it's a great way of making your piece more designed. I love the tartan ones. They look great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so clearly you're a very talented designer and you've done a lot of training and you won the Dr. Oliver Medal for best overall student when you graduated from a really top textile university. But still, it mustn't be easy to run a profitable business as an independent knitwear designer. So what are, what have, what's been your greatest challenges so far and how do you feel about the immediate and long-term future of your business? Um, well, I think my, my main challenge has always been that I'm a designer maker by training and not, um, not a trained businesswoman. So my, my happy place and my safe place is making, and I have a tendency to avoid the jobs that I don't like because I can just go, well, I, but I need to make another scarf. So for example, I, I don't really enjoy approaching shops about stocking my work. Um, I'm, I don't hugely enjoy shopping myself. So I find that research part quite challenging. And then there are also the challenges of, you know, Wholesale doesn't have very much margin to it. Um, so it's tricky to get the, the balance right. Um, but I do have some wonderful independent shops that stock my work and they're the, really the reason that I've been able to keep going over the last few years. So, so it is an important part. I just find it quite challenging in a few different ways. Um, I also have this, you know, now that I'm manufacturing, that comes with, it comes with exciting things like being able to make new designs, but it comes with different challenges like minimum order quantities and lead times and also matching quality. So I, you know, I have quite high quality standards. I want, well, in, you know, they, sh they can meet them. We just every now and again have to have conversations about what exactly I'm, I'm after. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're, you know, for them to make up an order, it takes 12 to 16 weeks. So um, it's, a, it's a really long time for me when I'm used to being able to make something in a matter of hours, admittedly not loads of them in a matter of hours, but you know, it, it's, it's a huge adjustment to make. Um, and in terms of the women's jumpers, I've had to guess which sizes and which colorways to go. And they've then turned out to be a slower sell because they're such an investment piece. So it's always a case of working out what I'll go forward with and what I won't continue anymore. Um, in terms of the immediate future, I mean, COVID 
has been a really interesting time during this, this pandemic. It's been great because I've been able to have some more time to create custom pieces for customers, whether it's a baby blanket or a blanket scarf in a particular colorway, or adding customization to my scarves where I'm combining my darning work with my knitwear. Um, but also the, the mending side of my business, the, the visible mending service and, and the tutorials have really grown in a way that I hadn't quite anticipated. So that, now that's a much huge, that's a much bigger part of my business. Uh, so going forward, it's just working out what the balance of my business will be, how much mending, how much making, how much outsourcing. Um, but ultimately, I want an environmentally friendly, you know, people friendly business with a really personal service. So it's just working out how best to do that. Well, it's been fantastic to have you on Fruity Knitting. I've been I've really enjoyed getting to hear what it's like as a knitwear designer, you know, who's mainly making ready-made so that's been very interesting but it's also been fascinating to see your visible mending and I think a lot of our viewers will find that extremely interesting and will be really keen to check out your tutorials so thanks a lot for sharing your time with us and your knowledge oh you're welcome thank you so much for having me it's been great I've really enjoyed it okay let's say goodbye to the audience bye okay bye